Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The period today will be devoted to a laboratory experience of waxing morphological contours and anatomy back on teeth. But before we begin our laboratory experience, it's necessary to go through the bench setup. The first thing you should have is a piece of white oil cloth uh, which has a dimension of 18 by 54 inches. This can be purchased at one of the local dime stores. It's used to put on the bench top when you're waxing, working on the bench top to keep wax and other materials from the bench top. It's necessary to have this before you can begin to do the laboratory experience. Another thing that you should have uh, available is a bowl, a rubber bowl of chilled water. Uh, because of the temperature that the laboratory gets, it's necessary at times to chill the uh, wax so it uh, remains workable. Also, you should have a piece of cotton out so that uh, you can use it to chill it, plus uh, we'll show you a little later how to polish wax with wet cotton. The wax that we'll use is the Slaycrest wax, which is a medium wax, and it'll come in this brass-colored uh, tin. The wax is also green. Now, there are several green waxes in your armamentarium, so be sure and, and get the right one, the Slaycrest wax. Uh, that comes in the brass colored tin. The next thing that you should have out is a Bunsen burner. Now, it's because of the television de demonstration why we use the alcohol lamp. However, you will use a Bunsen burner and the instructor will help you to adjust the flame so you have the proper type flame. Uh, when you hold the waxing instrument in the flame of any type of a Bunsen burner alcohol lamp, it should be held into the inner cone, just at the tip of the inner cone, which is the hottest uh, portion of the flame. Now, there are six instruments that you should have out whenever you're going to do waxing in this course. And you will notice that all of these instruments, which we're talking about in detail a little bit, are double-ended. And some of them are the same on each end, but at different angles. Some are different on each end, and you should be aware of uh, the difference so you can use whatever end is the proper one for the procedure. I'd like to talk in general for just a moment. Some of these instruments should be used in the flame, and some shouldn't. The ones you see now are the instruments that we do use in the flame. The first one is the beaver tail or number seven wax spatula. And this instrument is used to uh, heat, place in the wax, and transfer the wax to your tooth model. And we do this when we want to transfer a fair amount of wax. And you can use either end, doesn't make any difference, whichever uh, end uh, seems to work best for the procedure. The next instrument is the PK Thomas waxing instrument number one. And it is used to place cusps to uh, change contours, but you will notice that you can't pick up as much wax. So when you get to the point where you want to just transfer smaller amounts of wax, why then we can use this instrument. The next is a Ward C carver, uh, and it does have a fiber handle. Now, th this has a dual purpose. It can be heated uh, to transfer wax to alder wax once it's been placed on your tooth model, but it also has a sharp edge so it can be used as a carver. The original purpose of this instrument was designed to do waxing direct in the mouth, uh, but since this technique is not followed uh, to a great extent anymore, we do use it as a laboratory instrument, and it's a very excellent uh, instrument both to transfer wax and to carve with. Now, the whole object of using the technique that we're going to teach you is to flow wax and place it where you want it and not get great excesses that have to be carved off. And uh, as you go through this course and other courses to follow, you'll be taught then how to use the wax added technique to develop the morphology uh, of the tooth, the contours of the tooth, and the anatomy of the tooth. Now, the other three instruments uh, that I'd like to point out should never be put in the flame. Uh, the first one is an explorer. It's referred to as the cowhorn explorer, and uh, it has very limited use as far as changing wax or adding wax or contouring wax. It's mainly an instrument to use an examination and to judge contours and so on. We, don't, we do not use it in the flame, and we do not melt wax with it at any time. The next instrument is the P.K. Thomas Waxing Instrument number three. And the main purpose of this instrument is to create grooves. Uh, and it is uh, the same on both ends, but it is different in size. One end is larger than the other. Uh, it does not... Uh, uh, cut wax and so on, and, and contour it in that sense. It's used to place the uh, various grooves of the anatomy. 
generally speaking, the occlusal anatomy, and you're finding a, in the functional waxing course, which follows this one, why you will use that instrument for that purpose. The next instrument we have is a discoid cleoid carver. Now, this uh, instrument is used not only to carve wax, but is also used to carve amalgam. And if you place this instrument in the flame, why then it becomes useless when you need to have it to carve amalgam at a later date. So keep in mind now that three of the instruments are used in the flame. You can heat them. You can melt wax and transport wax. The other three instruments uh, we never place in the flame. Uh, they're used for placing grooves, contouring, and examination of the waxing procedures that we've gone through. All these instruments, when you finish using them, should be cleaned each day and put away. Don't put instruments away with a lot of wax and other debris hanging on them, which may cause a problem the next time that you want to use them. This is your visodont typodont, which will be your patient for these procedures. Uh, I'd like to point out a few things about the typodont and also about the contours and anatomy of the teeth. Let's first talk about the contours and anatomy of the teeth. Now, you've already had some information on the various surfaces of the, te of the teeth. This, as you know, is a labial surface. Then as we go uh, posterior, it's called either the facial or the buccal surface. As we look inside, we talk about the lingual surface. Then on the anterior teeth, this is called the incisal edge. And this is called the occlusal surface of the posterior teeth. Now, as you know, each tooth has a definite position in the arch, so we talk about the mesial and the distal. Now, as you can readily see that the only place you have two mesial surfaces contacting is between the central incisors maxillary, which is the upper arch, and mandibular, which is the lower arch. So then you have a mesial, distal, mesial, distal, and so on around the arch. Now, before we go ahead and remove these teeth and show you uh, what you should do in the waxing, you should study the teeth uh, so you have some idea of the arrangement of the teeth. And we'd like you to learn this in some detail. Now, first you should close the type of dot so you can see the inner occlusal relationship of the teeth and see how they come together. Now, the occlusion is really not ideal on this uh, particular instrument, but it will give you uh, some idea of the relationship of the maxillary or upper teeth with the mandibular or lower teeth. Also, we would like you to notice the contour of the teeth, because this is really what we're going to be working on in our waxing. And this is called the interproximal area. The space between the teeth is called interproximal area. And you notice that we want to re-wax and replace this uh, in the same uh, configuration that we see it. And then contrary to uh, many people's idea, this is not all a uh, concave. Uh, arc. There is convexities which allow for the interdental papillae. So we do want you to, to uh, be aware of that. Also, there's a certain amount of overjet that occurs of the maxillary teeth over the mandibular teeth, and that should be replaced. Also, you'll notice that the cusps follow into certain grooves of the lower teeth, and you should keep that in mind. Now, if we open the type of dot once more and take a peek at the lower teeth, we will notice the occlusal anatomy. And on each, uh, the mesial and the distal portion of the tooth, we will find a marginal ridge. And you notice that the marginal ridge of one tooth approximates in height the marginal ridge of another tooth. So when we wax, we want to re keep this in mind. Also, uh, we will notice that these marginal ridges are not tight together. There is a space of approximately a millimeter and then we come into the contact area of the tooth, which is approximately a millimeter or a millimeter plus below the marginal ridge. And so again, we want you to notice this so that when you wax these areas, you will return the tooth to a normal morphological contour. And the best way uh, to learn to do this is to study teeth uh, in, their, in either natural teeth or the artificial plastic teeth of your visodont and then uh, wax back to that uh, morphological contour. Uh, now, when another thing we'd like you to uh, see at this time is that these teeth are seated tightly into the visodont. And if you don't 
make sure that when you are waxing and checking your teeth as you wax them that they're seated tightly into the visodont while well, you may get all through waxing and find out that you uh, have not waxed into the proper height, the proper contour, and so on. Now, in order to remove these teeth, we have a special little instrument that each of you have that comes with your visodont, and it's used to push the teeth out. These teeth are keyed and locked, and there's a special instrument that's necessary to push them out. Also, uh, when you replace the teeth, you want to make sure that they are locked back in position so that as you work with them or somebody closes your visodont, uh, it doesn't alter it. Now, I'm going to push out one of the central incisors, and you can see that this pusher fits right into that little pin. You see the pusher on top of the pin. Now, you should align the pusher so it's in the same line as the pin. Then we can open the typodont, and then with a firm push, the tooth will come out. It can then be removed and either replaced or replaced with another tooth. And uh, you will be replacing it with a tooth now that is prepared, uh, one that you will be waxing upon. Now, since we removed tooth number eight, the upper right central incisor, you want to replace it with one now that has been prepared. And you notice that one of the angles is gone, and the lingual portion has been scooped out, and the incisal edges shortened. So we want to be sure now and place this tooth back in the proper position, and we want to make sure that it's completely seated. Now, it has to be pushed hard to seat. Don't just put it in and stop, and you'll notice that it is shorter than the teeth on either side. Now, if it's even, well, that means you don't have it seated. Now, once you think you have it seated, you should then close your typodont, and you should look then in at the pin again that uh, we saw uh, to begin with. And here you can see now that the pin is sticking up as it is supposed to. Now, sometimes this collar and some visodonts will lift up. If that happens, be sure and place your finger on the tooth and then push the collar back down since that's what locks the tooth in position. Okay, before we start uh, waxing the tooth, we want to give you a little exercise in uh, handling and manipulation of the wax. Now, we've already talked about the instruments. Some of them we use in the flame, some we don't. Also, we talked about the wax. And you notice that it, since I'm right-handed, I will keep my Bunsen burner and my wax on the right side. For those of you that are left-handed, you probably want to reverse this. But keep things so you don't have to reach all over. And you find out that as you handle the wax, you don't want to have to move too far. Now, we talked about the instruments. This, again, is a number seven spatch to the beaver tail wax instrument. And we want to hold it in the flame, and we don't want to get it too hot. We don't want it hot enough so that the wax smokes or that it burns. And this takes experience. You just have to learn uh, how long to hold it in until it melts the wax. Now, you notice the double cone of the flame. I think you can see that. And uh, we want to hold it into the, at the tip of the inner cone. And then we we'll carry it to the wax. And it should melt the wax. And yet you could turn it, and the wax will not drip off. If it drips off, that means you've got the wax too hot. Uh, again, if you heat the instrument in such a manner that you get it hot in the handle, the wax will always run towards the heat. And the next thing, you have wax all over the handle. And then all of a sudden, when you turn it, you get more wax you want. So we heat the blade of the instrument so it melts the wax. We should be able to turn it, and that's a little too hot. It dripped off. And after experimenting a few minutes while well, you're fine, you get just the right temperature so the wax will stay on. And that's the temperature we want then, so you can transport the wax over to whatever type of work you're doing. Now remember, when you get done uh, waxing, I always take and wipe off the excess wax while the instrument is warm. Keep your instruments clean and neat. Otherwise, why you find they become rather difficult and, and uh, they always have a lot of debris. Now the other one we talked about was the Ward C fiber handle carver. And again, as I'll remind you, this is dual purpose. You can either use it to heat it and transport wax, or you can carve it. Now, since this is a much lighter gauge metal, this means we won't hold it in the flame near as long. See, it was just a matter of a second, and then the wax should not drop off. Now, also, if you can see here, why we can take and we can carve with this instrument. And this instrument can then have the dual purpose of carving or heating and flowing wax, either one. Uh, it is sharp, uh, and if you're not careful, of course, you can can uh, cut yourself on the instrument. So be very careful, particularly when they're new. And remember, 
Wipe them off when you get done, then you don't have a lot of gooey wax to work with. Now the instrument that I want to demonstrate with is the P.K. Thomas number one waxing instrument. You'll find this a quite a universal instrument, and you can uh, flow wax, and, and you can flow different quantities. If you want to flow a lot of wax, of course, we would use the beaver tail, and if we want to flow a small amount, why then we would use uh, the P.K. Thomas waxing instrument number one. Now, as you heat this, remember we place it in the inner cone, and you have to experiment a little uh, to see what temperature it works with. You notice you can get a ball of molten wax on it, and that's the right temperature uh, to, to carry the wax. So once you learn how to do this, you heat it. Sometimes you have to go back to heat it if your wax isn't hot enough. Then we'll practice on our thumb. Now you notice the wax is too cool. It wouldn't flow at first. So that meant it was just a little too cool. We want you to practice doing this. You should never feel any heat through your thumbnail. If you feel heat, that means you're getting the wax too hot. And uh, you should practice so you can flow a little cone of wax. And you do this by just touching the wax. Notice how it fills right up on itself. And you can flow little cones. And, and uh, just learn, practice, until you can just put one drop on the top of another without even melting the one underneath it. And this is the way you should learn and practice now. Sometimes people can actually make the wax flow sideways. You can hold your instrument there while it cools off. And you should be able just to add wax and make it do what you want. Now if the instrument gets cold, nothing happens, see? Now when you flow a cone of wax, you want enough base on it that when you get it up top, it doesn't tip over. You see how you can draw the wax away out? And with practice, you can do just about anything you want with the wax. It's all a matter of control of heat in the instrument and using the proper instrument then to, to uh, wax with. And you can see that you can turn the wax any way you want. Maybe we can get a close up and I'll see how we can actually build it so it's at a 90 degree angle with itself. Now if you want to make a smaller uh, peak any place on the wax, you can heat the instrument slightly and, and remove a little wax too. Let the instrument pick up wax. See? And some people like to go ahead and make this into a U form. So you should be able to wax until you get this type of control with the wax. And if you get it too hot, of course, you're going to feel the heat through your thumbnail. And that's something we don't want. the wax goes to the wax. See, now we have a little, a little U-shaped thing, and, and you should feel no discomfort, no heat of any kind. Now, if your wax is rough and you want to smooth it out, you can heat the instrument a little bit, and you melt just the surface. Now, you should all practice until you have that kind of control of the wax. And then as you want to build a marginal ridge or a or place a triangular ridge, or even place a groove by this type of controlled heat on your instrument and picking the proper instrument, while well, you can go through and create any type of anatomy, contour, configuration that uh, you want to. And then remember, as you finish using your instrument each time, be sure and clean them off with a piece of Kleenex or a piece of cotton or some such thing as that so that your instruments are always clean. Now, another important thing to remember that any time you're waxing or using any hand instrument, you should form a support or a fulcrum with your hand or if it's in the patient's mouth, uh, on the patient's teeth so that you have a firm, controlled support in case the patient should jump quickly. If you have your thumb or your finger rested on the patient's teeth, why well, then you won't slip and injure or damage the patient. The same when you're trying to make very small movements or very controlled movements, uh, when you're waxing or carving, why if you rest your hand on the other hand, then you notice you have absolute control and you can make very small movements. And this is something you should practice now as you wax and then when you go into the mouth, 
and remember the same thing and uh, use it when you use other types of instruments in the patient's mouth. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.